Welcome to everybody to our final workshop um, that we are holding for the CTE CubeSat mission. And uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, quickly put the agenda up uh, for this evening. Um, here we go. And uh, there are um, three topics that we're going to be covering this evening. Um, firstly, uh, pointing and orientation. Abiyaka has prepared a, a presentation for us for all of the, our considerations that we need to make when designing our payload. Um, and he's also going to conclude that with a number of the trade-offs that we need to consider um, when, when we uh, finalize our design before the deadline, which is October the 16th. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with um, what we're going to do is we're going to show you the, um, the survey that has been put together for many of the players in the launch industry so that we can have a look at what are the various launch opportunities, whether it be balloons, suborbital flights, orbital flights, uh, trips to the International Space Station. So we're going to conclude with that. Um, Bianca, I was wondering, perhaps without further ado, can I uh, uh, stop sharing and can I hand over to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Judy. Um, let me do that. So in this um, segment here, I'm going to talk about um, pointing uh, in, um, in the, let's call it in satellite speak, attitude. Um, so Judy has a number of times kind of referred to 3CPO, 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 yes. C3, no, C3PO, that's how it is, C3PO, C for, for communication, 3P for the three Ps, which is uh, power, propulsion, and pointing in no specific order, and O for operations, which is the computer thing. So uh, we're gonna talk about um, pointing. So in pointing here, I'm referring to uh, attitude, determination subsystems so that's actually just to figure out where we're pointing an attitude determination and control subsystem sometimes also you drop the determination you just say attitude control subsystem so it's ABCF or AP or ACF <coughs> so early on we have um, talked about um, uh, comms so a couple of um, Session as go. I had like a, a session about comms, and it was actually two different sessions uh, because it took a little longer time than I expected. And then uh, last time we talked about electrical power subsystems, and this time we're going to talk about uh, attitude determination and control subsystems. Now, just uh, also a little bit about um, when we talk about this thing here, especially because it's uh, our last session. This part here is this part I call the engineering part. So this is the stuff when you make a satellite, you wanna make sure that all this is something that's working because this is the stuff that helps your science part which is the payload. Now think about it's like the payload is a passenger and the rest is your vehicle. There's no really reason to have a vehicle driving around if there's no passenger in it. The passenger is in this case here, the payload, this is the scientific, experiments you want to do. So especially when we talk about satellites for school or university, you want to try something out. Yes, it's also all right, you just copy something else that's been tried out before. Actually, that's a very good idea if it's your first launch. So you kind of like get familiar with the whole thing that has to happen in order to, to um, send a satellite in. But the payload is there where you want to do something. And for you uh, that actually saw um, the, the uh, Department of Education's uh, um, 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 event on uh, Tuesday, uh, Bob Twiggs was talking about uh, Sputnik, the first satellite that went up there. And the only thing it did was raise the temperature and it morphed it down. So think about a payload as uh, just some experiment you want to do. Now, if you want to do a better power system or better communication system, you will have a communication and power system that works already, and then you will have your new radio in the payload. So 
you know you can come talk to this thing here and then when you want to test your radio you have that as a payload uh, solution so later on it comes becomes a little bit uh, more important why it's going to be why we're talking about it like this here. but the that's how I divided engineering. It's the stuff that you know have to work and the scientific is uh, your payload, your experiment. So attitude determination, why do we want to do that? So one of the simple things is that if you have a camera on your side, a satellite, you want to know where the camera points. Now, obviously you can just take a picture and then uh, you can see in the picture where it pointed, you know, is it a black sky, does it point to, you know, the sun, or does it point down on Earth? Um, but, but if you, for example, don't want to download the picture before you know where it pointed, then you need an attitude determination. Now, you could actually ask the picture, you could have some AI that says, what did you take a picture of? Analyze it for me, and then download it. So you can kind of like also, later on you will see user camera as attitude, but it's a little complicated. So let me move on. If you're having a directional antenna, <clears throat> so some of you might have had a dish, um, satellite dish to kind of like watch TV, you know, that have to be pointed in a very specific way. And of course it points to a satellite, which similar also have a dish that have to point in a very specific direction. Now, because the satellite is flying so low, you don't have to have a directional antenna, you can have what's called an omnidirectional antenna. So you can actually see, uh, you can hear the radio independent on how it flies. But typically if you wanna have like a much faster radio, so a radio that runs in a gigahertz area, then it's also much more difficult to hear the radio. Uh, you need more strength to send the signal. So you wanna have an antenna that give more gain. Remember we talked about that in our comm section. So a directional antenna, like a patch antenna, is something where you want to make sure it points in more or less the right direction. You could also have other sensors that is important for you where you know where it points. So you might want to, for example, measure the background radiation in space, but then you want to know that your satellite points in space, because if you collect the data, you want to know that it doesn't point at Earth and kind of like where it points but it could be any other sensor where you want to know what the uh, direction is. If you have solar panels, you can move around. They might sit like on some kind of server motor. Then you want to make sure that you can actually point the solar panel in the right direction. And therefore you might also want to know where is your satellite pointing. Now you could also do that by just asking the solar panel, what is the, tell me when you get the best signal. Little Island, when you were standing on the roof in all days and standing with the antenna, <clears throat> to figure out when you got the best signal. And um, then, for example, if you have a propulsion on your satellite, then you also want to know that you blast off in the right direction. So, for example, the International Space Station have a propulsion system so it can keep its orbit. So, anything you put into space that flies around Earth, especially even Leo, will have a drag because there's even though hardly any atmosphere, there's still a little bit that slows you down over time a little bit. And that means that you're falling to earth uh, as, as times goes by. So you wanna kind of like move a little bit away from earth from time to time, you want propulsion. But if you are flipping around, you don't wanna start the rocket while it's pointing in the wrong direction. And then for example, thermal control, you want maybe to know that now I'm pointing towards the sun and I have some sensors there's, uh, you know, not great at being pointing at the sun. So you might want to close the lid or somehow, you know, control that, um, that, that depending on where you're pointing, certain things have to happen on your satellite. So how do we do this determination? How do we figure out how to, um, where we are? So I talked about the camera before. So, you know, you can actually, take a camera and this is literally how we work as a humans. We have our eyes and when we walk, we kind of use the eyes and analyze where we're walking and we use that to kind of like figure out <coughs> if we are, you know, so we don't trip. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, with a, and a camera works the same way, but the difference is with a human being, we can analyze what we see very fast 
and therefore it's a all right way of actually walking and, and using your eyes. But on a satellite, if you use a camera, you have to analyze all the data that comes in to figure out if it's uh, all right or not all right. So therefore, um, uh, you, the, the, the camera is only great if you have the power of AI or something like on board. And you probably don't have that. So, so you know, my philosophy is the camera is a, a bad solution for attitude determination, especially on a satellite. Then you can take an Earth sensor. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some both attitude determination solutions and also control systems that I actually have no clue about. And one of the reasons I don't have a clue about it is that the Earth Center here, and I took the first and the best I could find on the internet, cost $15,000. So that's a very expensive uh, sensor to figure out where Earth is. Uh, and some sensor like this one here cost $12,000. And it's again, you know, very expensive, especially if um, you know, might not fly the satellite or you just want to experiment with something or learn something. These are and these are meant for cubes that they're not necessarily big. And then you have something called a star tracker, and you can see with thirty-five thousand dollars for a star tracker uh, that's going to burn up in the atmosphere when the satellite is um, finished with use. You might rather want to buy an uh, entry-level Tesla for that amount of money. They have a very good resale value. Um, but you can also use an IMU, uh, which is an accelerometer, magnometer, and gyroscope, and we're selling one of those for $32. So that's a very good um, price and difference. And, and one of the great stuff with that is that it's actually included in FK90. So the IMU has three sensors built into one. It has an accelerometer, and magnometer, and a gyroscope. So of course, I'm going to talk more about this one here, especially because it's in your kit, and especially because the other ones are just like out of my wallet. And um, one day when I build a big satellite, I might look at these kind of things. So an IMU, what is an IMU? So I'm gonna talk about it from a point of view that you actually already know what an IMU is. So you would have one in your smartphone. You have an iPhone or Samsung or LG or one of those uh, Android phones, then when you have a, for example, picture on your phone and you tilt the, uh, the phone you know, sideways and the picture tilts sideways, it does that because it has an IMU inside and it knows you tilt it around. You also have it on game controls like the Nintendo Wii where you, know, you move the, 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 the video game controller around without pressing any buttons and the system knows that. If you have like a, a, a VR system, virtual reality system, you know, like, a, there's um, things you put on your, your head, faces, eyes, and then you kind of like step inside a virtual room. When you turn your head, it's an IMU to kind of like figure out how much to turn your head and therefore in what direction you kind of like looking and then it will align a picture to that so you look in the right direction. You can have stuff that you align like an antenna and things like that. So you want to use this thing to position it. Like for example, if it has to be perfectly um, leveled, um, horizontal leveled, you can use an IMU to do that. You know, one of those with a little glass bubble in, I uh, don't know what the English word is for it, but you know, when you have to put a picture up on a wall, an IMU is like an electronic version that can be used like that also. Aircrafts are using it with or without pilot, uh, you know, um, uh, they use this thing here to figure out how they're leveled. They use it for roll, pitch, and jaw to figure out how it is. Uh, I have a smart TV where I have a TV control and uh, and I can actually point at the screen with this thing here. There's no laser or anything like that that points on it. It just knows how I hold it in my hand and then I have a little cursor moving around on the screen. And I can use that like a mouse that I hold in my hand. A drone have it, it figures out how much power it has to give to those different rotors that sit on top of the drone. And on GPS, we also use it. So for example, if you, drive through a channel, uh, then uh, the GPS have no signal into the channel. But it's still no more or less how you're driving because uh, the car turns and the IMU can feel now turn a little bit left, a little bit right, and things like that. So they try to calculate how you drive. And when you come out on the other side of the tunnel, it kind of like, uh, you know, jumps back when I get to GPS position. That's called GPS dead reckoning when it kind of like estimates where you are based on the IMU. Obviously, if it's a very, very long tunnel, it might be different, but typically you maybe also drive with a map 
So it will kind of like say, well, you're probably still on this road here. If we kind of like talk a little bit more satellite in uh, or other stuff, uh, for example, you can use it to, to measure um, if you shake something. So if you want to play around with it, uh, you can actually use it instead of uh, a button on, on the circuit. So you can say, if I'm shaking the circuit, I want to do something. And that's kind of like, uh, is a, like a vibration. So you can also put it on top of a motor or like we had it. Uh, we had one of those on the International Space Station and we could see when one of the other experiments started the fan because the little vibration was gonna, uh, the fan made was felt in the, in the chassis we were co-hosted and we could then pick up the vibration there. So turning clipping as I talked about and a Segway, you know a Segway is one of those uh, two wheeled uh, kind of like scooter you stand on that uh, when you lean forward it's a right forward. Uh, that is actually controlled by a gyroscope and accelerometer. There's a magnometer also. Um, so for example, that will pick up metal. So you will be able to kind of like use that to find like a nail in a wall that's hidden, uh, things like that. And then that <coughs> the real use for, uh, usefulness of a magnometer here is that it's a compass. So it will tell you where magnetic north is. Now, because of that, on a satellite, <coughs> typically if you have a magnometer, you need to put it away from the satellite, but you know, you can't really put it away. Hang on. <coughs> hmm. oh, sorry. You can't really put it away um, out there in space. So what the, you normally do is that you have this long arm and you put your, magnometer out there at the end of the arm. So that's what I illustrated here with a satellite that's probably bigger than any of us will ever build. So let's look at this and use this in the XK90 kit here, just so you have an understanding of, uh, of, of how it works here. So uh, our um, SIO1 have a little chip on that's called a lsm 9 ds one come from a, you know, a chip manufacturer and uh, that actually measures acceleration, so that's accelerometer, the angular rate, that's a gyroscope, and the magnetic field, that's the magnetometer here. And it does it in X, Y, and Z. So you will get, if it lies on a table, for example, it will tell you that there's one G in the Z axis. So if it's just lying still, one G in the Z axis, zero and X and Y axis and X axis. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, if you put it off, Side as you know, tilted 90 degrees, then it will show you um, the it will show you the one G in one of the other factors, and and this is great because you can you know use this thing here also to teach like uh, Pythagoras in in 3D here with, with these vectors. So you can take the vectors and convert them to a magnitude, and then you will get doesn't matter how you look at it, the magnitude if it's lying still will give you one G. And of course, it's in space and flies on ISS or your satellite, it will give you microgravity, so 0 0.00 something G. When we had an International Space Station, it will be 0 0.005 or 0 0.004, and we still could pick up the vibration of the motor. What I put here is like a, a plus minus 2 to 16 G. So this is the max readout. So the way most sensor works is that they're doing something analog, they have a ADC, a converter, and then the more accuracy you have to have, the smaller that number has to be the max number. So you can set it to, I uh, say, listen, I'm only gonna measure up to two G, so I wanna have an accuracy where the max is plus minus two G, so it's from minus two G to plus two G. Or it could be from minus eight G to plus eight G, or from minus uh, 16 G to plus 16 G. So it depends on what you use it for. If you want to, for example, make yourself a rocket car or something like that, it maybe gets a 16 G. If you only use it in space, maybe plus minus two G is actually enough. And the same goes with, for example, the magnetic field that measured in Gauss. So in uh, the linear acceleration, you will measure it in, in G force. And that's, of course, uh, you can convert to meter per second squared. In um, uh, the, the uh, magnometer is measured in Gauss or milligauss. And that can be converted to Tesla. Um, and then um, 
the angular rate is degrees per second that it turns. Uh, as you can see on the diagram here, it kind of like shows that the, it's a it's speed of it turns. So, so these, these different things, and there are a lot of formulas. I'm not going to go into details of how the formula works and all that kind of stuff. But this is the MU is the one that kind of like gives you all the different ways of measure stuff. So you kind of like know more or less where you're pointing, which way, how it's moving, all that kind of stuff. So this is the what's in IMU. You can also get IMU that only have the accelerometer, and IMU that only have an accelerometer and magnometer. Ours have all three, and it's called nine degree of freedom. So X, Y, and Z will three different instruments. You will sometimes say 10 degree of freedom, and just because it also measures temperature. But almost all chips measures temperature because they have to do that in order to give you accurate reading. So they have to adjust themselves a little bit depending on what the environment is. And then you can, of course, ask uh, what is the temperature with some of these chips. Some can measure, but it's not allowed to give it, that doesn't give it to you. But when you see 10 degree of freedom or 9 degree of freedom, it's more or less the same. Okay. So let's talk about attitude control. So the first thing I talked about here was just to figure out which way we are pointing. Now we want to point in the right direction. So, you know, once we now know where we are, we want to point somewhere. So let's talk about that. So how do we do that? Well, there is a number of different ways. And this time I'm going to start from the bottom here with the thruster. So here's a set of thrusters for a CubeSat to a quarter of a million dollars. Now, uh, I have to be honest, uh, I looked at this website where I found this. This was the, there was two trusts and this was the more, more expensive one. But it wasn't like the other one was cheap either. Uh, and they're just like, uh, trust this is just so far away from what I can imagine that I will be allowed to put on a satellite. So I hardly even know what it's about. It could be cold trusters, that's kind of like just a gas. Or it can be, you know, xenon or, you know, a, 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 you know, all kind of different thrusters. But in general, when you want to build a satellite, if you have any kind of thrusters on board, then it's the guys who launch the satellite for you start getting very nervous because, um, you know, is it something that can explode or, you know, thrusters just normally mean something that can generate power. <coughs> then you have uh, reaction wheels or control moment uh, gyroscope. So the difference between the one and the other is just in one case you have like one to three wheels so it's one set and it's 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 a spinning the speed of the spinning of the wheels that kind of like um, um, turn the satellite around because it's kind of like move uh, uh, it creates a movement that that uh, makes you move in in a direction so if uh, if it wants you to move in the one axis it spins the wheel in that axis so you have three wheels the other one, you have one wheel, the spin. So, so when you have three wheels, it just adjusts the speed of how these different wheels spin. When you have, <coughs> when you have uh, the other ones, it's like just one wheel that you turn in the direction you want to have that spinning. In both cases, I mean, you can see here, reactions wheel $7,000. Yes, it's not, it seems cheap compared to some of the sensors we had before, but, but these solutions are expensive also. And, that they consume a lot of space. So up here, I have magnets, and that can also be used, and you can get 50 of those from Amazon for $9. So, uh, so that gives you like a passive attitude control, but that's still an attitude control. You still know exactly where you're pointing at any given time, and that's better than maybe not know it at all. So let's look at the, some of the different options here, and then I come in back to it. So with passive magnets, what you do is that you kind of like figure out where you want to point, and then you calculate where you should put a magnet and which way it should turn and things like that. And it will point at the same time when it flies over the same time every time. I'm getting more into that because that's a, uh, maybe an interesting thing. Uh, the magnet talker which I'm also gonna talk about, is kind of like an electro electromagnet, so you can turn it on and off. And it's a, obviously a more expensive solution of the passive magnet, but it had some benefits without necessarily being super uh, space costly to put into your satellite. So magnet talker is probably, um, in my view, for, for a lot of student satellite, one of the more useful ones. But the last one is just your lock. 
don't have any attitude control and you're just flying around and you just use attitude determination to figure out where you point. So for example, the first satellite our local university put up here, that didn't have any attitude control. That was just flipping and spinning around in space. And, it, and, and that was all right because its mission was to work as a, a kind of like a radio relay for something that was testing. So they were sending like a signal up and they were getting a ping back and they didn't need any direction for that. It was a great first satellite to build, but it was a CubeSat, so they had a lot of space, so they decided to put a camera in. And of course, the camera would shoot a picture, you know, in, uh, in different directions. And then when the camera was at the ground station, they were just under the picture. And, you know, sometimes they just got black space, sometimes they flew over something interesting uh, on, on, you know, Earth, and they had a picture of that, and they downloaded that. It was their own ground station, and um, they didn't use for anything else. It wasn't like it was taking up anything. It doesn't cost any airtime. So every time it was within range, so just downloaded uh, pictures it had. Uh, <clears throat> if if they could, if they had like any any kind of attitude control, they could have, of course, have calculated that. Hey, that picture there um, was taken at this point of time, and we know uh, where the satellite is using uh, the two line elements. So we know exactly when the satellite was at a certain point, and if you also knew how it pointed, then we say, well, this is gonna be a picture of Italy, let's download and see how that looks like. But, you know, that is if you are not having something mission critical. The problem is when you don't have uh, attitude control, it also, over time, the satellite tends to spin faster and faster. It tumbles faster and faster, and as it tumbles faster and faster, Radio starts not being happy about that. So you start losing control over your satellite and eventually you can't communicate with it anymore and it's just something around. Now, depending on what your mission was, um, then maybe you're finished with it. If it's like after a couple of years, yeah, maybe it takes some years before it burns up in the atmosphere, but you got the mission out of it anyhow. So that's how many of the satellites operate up there. And for student satellites, if you're one of those that can get it to work first time around, well, then you're in the top 50% because most satellite students sent off or half the students that satellite been sent off, they don't work at all. So, um, so that's the reason why um, having a simple project is probably better than, than have some sort of advanced one and then just hope that it works. Okay, so let's uh, look at magnets. So on magnets here, um, the way it works is that you, when you send a satellite off, it, uh, it, it, it flies around Earth and it flies around in a very specific uh, route and it has a specific speed and direction and all that kind of stuff. And since there's no kind of like weather or anything like that that can change that, then uh, you will be able to calculate exactly where it is at any given point. And, um, but you also know what the magnetic field is like uh, at a specific point. So you might want to say, listen, I want the satellite to point like that when it's over my ground station because I have my high speed directional antenna there. Or maybe I want it to be able to take a picture when it's over this place here. I don't care the rest of this uh, times. So I just want to make sure the camera pointing down there because I'm going to take a picture of my farm and how it's growing every day it flies over like that. So, so the, the way is, is that, you think about this way here, that satellite is actually, and I hope here, let me just make sure that you can see my, uh, my picture here. So if, if this is Earth and this is my satellite, you can see it pointing down like that. As it flies around Earth, it will kind of like fly around there and point in all directions. And then it will flip around and it will turn downwards again when it comes to the south pole. I will do like the same here, and it will flip around when it comes up here. Okay, so it kind of like turns uh, in the same direction, which is down when it's the north pole and away in the south pole, and then it turns into the, the you know 180 degrees when it's over equator. So so obviously the satellite. Uh, you can put the camera, you know, so it, it matches like how it flies, but it's easier just to put the magnet so it actually points in the right direction. So, so that's where you want to use a magnet. As you can see, 
that when it flies around the Earth like that. Now, this is like a, a kind of like a, a drawing of a polar orbit, or like at least a polar orbit over the magnet, uh, over the magnetic north and south. If you fly, for example, the International Space Station, you will not fly over the poles, but you will still have a, quite a good idea about how you point when you fly around. So, so that is where you can use what you will call a permanent or passive magnet on your um, satellite. Then um, it's a magnet toggle, and a magnet toggle is uh, like an electromagnet. So I have a, there in the middle, the blue one here is an electromagnet. So if you put some power through uh, um, plus and minus here, it will create electric field in the one and all direction, depending on where plus and minus is. A magnetic field. And, and uh, that one is just a standard uh, magnet talker. But the big picture with the, with the uh, brass end is kind of like how one looks like when, it's, uh, when you buy them loose. And then uh, on the bottom there, the orange one is a magnet talker, which is, um, you can see there's two of them. And there's two because you want to control it in two directions. So if you want to control in three directions, all three directions, so X, Y, and Z, you want to put three of these in. There's other combinations where you actually have, um, <coughs> where you create, um, this by having it in a loop. So you have like a, a loop uh, instead of, uh, of, of, of um, um, a core like uh, as shown here. And with a loop, you can kind of like do some sp uh, space saving depending on how much you need to control your satellite. And you can mix it maybe with magnets. So you kind of like say, well, it's stable like that, but I just want to have it rotating on, uh, around this axis and the rest of the axis is fine like that. Now, the whole thing is that remember that if you especially have a magnet or something like this on, then your magnet, uh, your your IMU, the mag um, magnometer, will not work. I will, you know, give you a wrong reading. So you want to be able to switch this off with a magnet talker. You can switch off your magnetic field, and then with a, but with a permanent magnet, it's always there. So therefore, you will always have a problem with your uh, magnometer. But just remember, if you have a magnet there and it's pointing a certain way, because you know that, because you put it there, and you want it to have to point like that, you might not need to figure out from a magnometer which way it then points, because yeah, well, it should point in a certain way. So, so, um, <clears throat> so, so just remember some of these uh, constraints that you have like that. And that's it for me. I hope. Um, that was um, um, gave a little bit of background on pointing, and if there's any questions, then um, um, let's have them. Judy, uh, great, Bianca, thank you very much. Um, I can see here that uh, in the chat channel that um, uh, Shivam had a question, uh, which was also uh, answered by William Edmondson. So I was actually just wondering if maybe. Um, uh, Shivam and, and William, if you if you would like to uh, um, have this discussion for for everyone. Oh yes, Judy. Um, it might be helpful. Um, because it's really a matter of and I'm rereading the question. How does one go about choosing the appropriate attitude determination system? And in general, it really depends on your, the pointing accuracy that's required by your mission. So if you have a mission in which you're trying to image something, and you need fairly, high, fairly good pointing accuracy with very little jitter, then that's gonna cost you because you're gonna need a better or more accurate ADCS. But if you're, if you need something that, let's say for a communication, and you place the antennas in a correct way, you could actually, 
just have some inexpensive magnetorquers or magnets uh, because you don't really care or you can just let it spin. So um, that's just a point that I wanted to make in terms of how and when you choose um, the ADCS system. Great, William. Thank you very much for that. Um, Warren, Warren has a question. Warren, if you if you'd like to to ask your your question to to the group. Yes. Um, well, actually, I had two questions, and they revolve <laughs> reaction wheels. No pun intended. Um, the reaction wheel is basically a um, like a gyroscope, right? And the spacecraft. It's conservation of angular momentum is the basic principle. So if you speed up in one direction, I'm, I'm making motions with my hand and I realize my video is off. But anyway, you speed up in one direction, the spacecraft is going to rotate the opposite direction to con conserve angular momentum. So the question is, there, and I have some experience with the previous company in building high-speed flywheels. It seems that they charge an awful lot of money if you buy a commercial reaction wheel. Do you know of any, at least at the university level, of anybody that's built their own reaction wheel? It seems like a well-equipped lab might be able to pull that off. So, Warren, I just uh, was talking with somebody yesterday, and they built their own using uh, dental drills. Really? Yeah. Who is that? I got to find out who exactly it is. Yeah. Did it work? Uh, <laughs> I can let you know. <laughs> OK. But sure. uh, the one thing about um, dental drills is they're reliable. They're fairly going to give you a consistent RPM. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're, but, yeah. you know. Sorry. So that was the first time I heard of it. Well, you yeah, consistent R, consistent control of the RPM, right? Because you do need to vary the RPM if you want to turn the, the thing, right? Right. right. Uh, I, I, I had another, I talked to this fellow who actually, at John Ricosi, I don't know if you know him. He's at the Marshall Space Flight Center, and he's written some papers on university CubeSat attitude control. And another thing he mentioned, if you have a 3U, you can stack it in such a way, uh, distribute the mass so that you get some stabilization from the gravity gradient. Has anybody had an experience with, with the gravity gradient uh, stabilization? I know I haven't. Okay. Well, you put it heavy, sorry. Yeah, so, so I don't think it's the same thing here, but I know that if you, if you go outside you know, a cube, like for example, with the synthet that we flew on, and I assume it's the same with, with the 3U, is that it it will it will it will um it will it will fly in a ballistic curve it will it will uh, it will move itself around to the least amount of drag uh mm -hmm. so so it will have the one end or the other end pointing uh, towards its flight direction if you take for example a, a tree so 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 you will know where it flies in that axis um assuming that uh, you know it started in 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 the right way so so it's kind of like little, LA, you know, some things that you drop uh, toward Earth, uh, you know, uh, the, the wind that uh, will kind of like get it to fly in the, the right direction. And I know there's very little drag and things like that, but that's when we did the uh, the SINSAT the, the mission last year, uh, that was what, uh, that is like a, a 10 by 10, or I think like 11 by 12 centimeter, but it's only a few centimeter thin. So, so therefore it will have, it it will kind of like fly with the with the edge towards um, um, its its flight direction, and 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 kind of like you will have a a slight idea about at least a, around one axis of where it was pointing. Um, but but if, and of course with the yeah, I'm sorry yeah but but a thin set is typically dropped off the second stage in a very low orbit right, so you can yes. use you can usually count on a lot of aerodynamic effects right and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So as opposed yeah. to CubeSat might be uh, higher. And I guess a related question, has anybody heard of a, uh, a home-built, or not home-built, but a university-built uh, magneto-torquer? I mean, 
it looks like a very simple device. I went on Pumpkin and some of those sites, and they want 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 for a bar for a, a coil <laughs> around a magnetic material. And I don't know, but that seems a little exorbitant. Um, and I think the real the real brains there has to be controlling the current through it, right? You have to have that feedback loop. And but once you have a magneto torquer, does that mean that um, your magnetometer is now useless as for attitude control. Can you have both, right? Does, does the magneto torquer in, interfere with the uh, magnetometer is the basic question. So I, I, I don't have any experience with it, but the way I, I, I learned about it was that with the magnetometer, mag, uh, sorry, with the uh, magnet torquer, you can, if you turn it off, it doesn't create this man, magnetic field. And therefore, you what you do is that you you switch off the magnometer, well, sorry, but the magnet talker, while you're using the magnometer. If that makes uh, sense, so it's kind of like uh, similar to a radio. You don't transmit and receive at the same time, but but that that's what I believe. Now right. I don't have the experiments with, uh, like experience, so, so I can't tell you if it's exactly work like that. But that's kind of like what I was told. The thing is just that with the uh, the well, magnometer is that it's not just a magnetic field, but I mean, that's like the, the big culprit, obviously. But also, you know, other metal and things like that. But I think you can kind of like calibrate yourself out of that, um, you know, before you, 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 you fly. Um, but otherwise, um, the reason why, uh, and uh, uh, just to answer your first question, uh, I, was, I was looking for, uh, you know, how to build a, you know, um, uh, uh, magnet talk for, for, for a very small satellite project um, that, that uh, I've been looking at. And there's, um, um, there's a company called Pinnacle, uh, sorry, that's called um, Princeton Satellite. Princeton Satellite. So if you Google Princeton Satellite Magnet Talker, they have a paper there where they're talking about uh, uh, taking, a, you know, a, a kind of like, I don't know if it's a magnet talker or like a, a sodium. Uh, Sort of permanent magnet. There's like a couple of different solutions there, but they had like a 95 millimeter rod. There was one millimeter in diameter, I think it was, and they had two of those, and and then uh, they played with that somehow. Um, so that's one source. Um, but what I have seen is that so uh, our local university they have been, you know, building their own magnet talker, and they have this, uh, uh, you know, built these kind of like a test instrument in wood to, to kind of like figure out how they, you, you could uh, stuff to twist around. So they kind of like test it. I can't remember what it's called. There's probably like some, um, some proper name for this thing here, but it's like this big wood structure where they can kind of like simulate the magnetic field around Earth. That's slightly stronger, obviously, to, uh, to, to not get interfered by Earth, but, but then they hang up the satellites inside and they use the home built magnet talker to kind of like figure out if it works and how they can twist it around. Uh, I have to say, I did a, 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 a calculation on a, uh, on a sun sensor earlier today for, for somebody else. And uh, there was a sun sensor here where they're selling it for $6,000 and they're using a, a very simple solution. It's actually six solar panels you put on each side of the satellite. And then, and you put each of these two these small solar panels in a in kind of like a, a L shape, uh, and then you use that to kind of like figure out how much sun you get from a different sensor, and then you can use that to calculate uh, where the sun is. They're selling that for six thousand, and I because we use the same uh, solar panel for for other stuff, I calculated that we could probably produce the same thing for eighteen dollars. Yeah, um, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and and the thing is that uh, on top of that, I need uh, 90 days or three months to deliver them. Um, and you know, um, most of our stuff is um, you know over the counter from um, from a supplier. But but the thing is that it, what I find is that a lot of these things, um, in in most cases, if it's flown before and therefore have flight tests and all that kind of stuff, people kind of like say, well, I don't have time to research all that. My mission has cost fifty thousand just to launch it. I'm gonna buy this for six hours and I don't have to worry about it. On the other hand, a lot of this thing here hasn't actually flown before. I mean, they will say on the website if you have flight here, it's or not. So 
I, I find that a lot of the pricing on 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 these components is uh, is as I said to Judy when I talked about it earlier today. It's um, it's Ember is closing. Um, it's kind of like uh, if it doesn't cost that amount of money, it's probably not useful in space. And of course, I can understand that if it's kind of like being tested and have certification from ESA and ESA, and if it's red hardening and all those different things. But like this solar sensor here, there's no red hardening because you, there's nothing to red harden here. You know, it's usually normal FR4 PCB. It's you know all that kind of stuff. So so. So I don't understand how pricing is for everything. I can understand when someone, you know, very accurate uh, uh, brass that's being drilled and mined and milled, uh, you know, very accurately and have a sensor and all that kind of stuff. And the price is high because they only make five a year. And if you have to do it yourself, it will take you a long time. But but there's certainly other stuff where, uh, like for example, uh, you know, a passive magnet or a magnet holder, you should be able to make it yourself. But you know, you just have to understand what the physics is behind it before you uh, um, you uh, throw yourself over that. And hopefully, most of the universities have that uh, skill right. set already. I don't. Uh, just just a follow up. You mentioned the university magnet talker that with the I think it was the ninety five by one millimeter rod. What do you know? Yeah. What university? You know which university that was? That in South Africa? No, no. So that wasn't a university. That was a company that uh, published a paper. And it, uh, I can send you the uh, link here um, uh, just now. But but it comes from a company called uh, called Princeton Satellite. Oh, I see. And I think I think their website is like P Satellite or something like that. Princeton Satellite. So they had an article about this thing here. Um, so I'm pretty sure if you say Princeton Satellite and Magnet Talker or or Magnet or 95. <laughs> You'll find it. That's what I'm going to do just now, and then I'll send you the link. And, and just one line. I'm sorry to take you so much time. Go for it. Go for it. No problem. You, you talked about the uh, the test jig that was built in wood to test the magneto torque. Yeah. Was that was that for university or was that Princeton satellite? No, that was uh, that was uh, Cape Peninsula University, and and uh, I've seen it many places. I mean, that's like nearly any university that do anything in space stuff. They seem to build this rig here. So I've seen it the uh, in Moorhead University, I've seen it everywhere. So, so it's kind of like, if you can imagine a cube, just very large, so like a meter by a meter, or three feet by three feet by three feet or whatever, but something like that. And then it have like two spoils in uh, all three directions, okay? And then right. they actually just turn up the volume, and that creates a magnetic field in the, uh, that can direct where north is, like this in here. And then they have like a, I assume like a um, an island string where they have the satellite hanging there, and they can then test this, you know, in the well at least one dimension at a time how it twists around and and, and that stuff. Um, I think I have a picture are, of a uh, student. Yeah, William. That's got a Helmholtz cage. Helmholtz yeah. Cage. Right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. See, I knew it had like some name. <laughs> yeah, and just to add to. Uh, University magnet talkers. Back when CubeSats were just started, most universities created their own. So uh, if you go to Cal Poly or University of Colorado, US, Michigan, originally they've um, they created their own. So the the plans are out there. And it's fairly straightforward, and they just tack it onto the back of the um, solar cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm wondering, are there any more questions? Great. I think uh, what, what I'd like to do is that I'd, I'd just like to to conclude with with our, our final our final topic. And uh, that, that relates to uh, various launch opportunities for schools. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen again. And uh, I'm just going to show you quickly. Um, this, is the, this is the email that's going to be going out um, uh, next week. Uh, what it is, is it's, it's a call to uh, um, many, uh, many participating organizations. 
And uh, what it is, is that the, the question is going to be asked, can your organization offer flights to participants? Um, what we're doing is that we, we, we've got a number of uh, school programs uh, that we're involved in, um, in, in a number of places globally. And uh, so, so we're looking for flights uh, for, for a, a number of schools. Um, as we are offering schools and universities from around the world easier and lower cost access to space, by offering an easy to use and inexpensive flight hardware, we are looking for partners who can offer any kind of off the ground experience. Please fill in this Google form. So what I'm going to do is that I'm now going to show you this, this um, Google form of which we speak. So let's go there. Um, there we go, great. So this is our this is this is the Google form. Um, can can everybody see that? Bianca? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, yes. Okay, great. So so what it is is it's going to take everybody uh, to to this form. So what they'll do is that they will be able to complete this. So what, what I want to do is that I want to show you um, the various options that, that we are looking for. So yeah, space flights, uh, of course, that's great. Uh, orbital, suborbital, and uh, atmospheric flights. Um, actually, before we came onto this workshop, we were, we were looking out for the um, Blue Origin launch uh, that was going to take place today, but unfortunately it got scrubbed. So. Um, but you know that's that's uh, that's um, up and down. Um, atmospheric flights, uh, drone UAV, high altitude weather balloon, um, limited altitude helium or hydrogen based balloon flights, um, unpressurized cargo hull flights, under the seat flights, um, and then just uh, looking at uh, various altitude levels and uh, then space-like features in terms of unpressurized, free-flowing uh, free air microgravity, sudden acceleration or deceleration. Like for example, when, you're, when your, hydrogen, your uh, hydrogen or helium balloon bursts, wow, it, it gives a massive vibration. And then also just to, to look at, at, um, at volumes. So uh, this, is, um, this is the uh, uh, call call to action that we're going to be sending out next week so that we can really expand uh, the opportunities for, for schools and, and students uh, participating. So what I'd like to do is um, before we, uh, there we go, Bianca has put that uh, Princeton satellite link uh, in the chat uh, for, for everybody and, um, and also the the, the link to uh, the, the, the space flight opportunities. So what I would like to do is that I'd like to ask anybody if they've got any further questions that they'd like to ask, anything that they'd like to say before we round it off for this, um, this series of workshops. Uh, okay, so I think I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the last number of weeks. Um, we believe that we've uh, we've tried our best <laughs> to cover a number of the topics uh, that one one needs to consider, and um, we will certainly be uploading this video again to the Exynobox YouTube channel and I will be sending you out the link. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. And for now, from me, it's over.